Hello, and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. I'm Laura. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. Today, we're sitting down to discuss The Memory Police by Yoko Ogawa, a haunting dystopian novel that explores questions of power, trauma, and state surveillance, written by one of Japan's leading contemporary novelists. On an unnamed island, things disappear. Objects vanish from memory, one following another, no time scale, no discernible pattern. The sinister memory police watch over it all, ready to enforce the disappearances should people remember. Author Yoko Ogawa has won every major Japanese literary award, and the memory police was shortlisted for this year's Booker International Prize. Fellow author Madeline Tien called the book a masterpiece, a deep pool that can be experienced as fable or allegory, warning and illumination. But never mind all that, what did my book club make of it? Did it spark debate? Did we love it? Did we loathe it? Keep listening to find out. It is another remote recording session. I'm here in my living room and you are over there in a very chilly shed. Yeah. Do you know, I had a real life experience that I think maybe mirrors the sort of stuff that was happening in the memory police. I woke up in the morning and picked up my phone, as one does, and it had updated in the night. It had gone to a new operating system and I don't know whether it's introduced some new icons or what but everything has moved and so (laughs) (laughs) my thumbs are looking for things that used to be in certain places that are not there and I've got so much on my phone that I'm not really capable now of working out what's changed. I think things (laughs) might be missing but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know because I don't remember them. Well, it's interesting because I read a Wired review of this book and it was talking about how this is very much a novel about the digital world and how we are forgetting things and we are losing things and we are missing things. And how could you not read this novel as an allegory for that? And I was like, oh, <laughs> we didn't talk about that at all. <laughs> yeah, that's. I read that Wired article too and I thought that was really interesting because I hadn't realised but the book was originally published in Japan in 1994 and so it's actually it's over 25 years old. And when it was written, they didn't have the internet. You know, all of that was only just beginning to get going. And one of the things that I thought was so interesting about it is how absolutely contemporary and relevant it felt. Definitely to me, the hallmarks of a classic, because it does have this timeless quality and it feels like you could almost project onto it the anxieties of any age. Shall we expand on our summary, give people a better sense of exactly what this book is about? Yeah, tell us about it. The Memory Police is set on an unnamed island where people are living through an epidemic of collective forgetting. When objects such as perfume, roses, birds, even novels disappear from people's memories, they disappear from real life as well. The disappearances are enforced by the Memory Police, who ransack people's houses, removing all evidence of the thing that has been forgotten. They are also on the hunt for those few people who are immune to the collective amnesia, who live in fear of discovery. Our narrator is a novelist who lives alone, with no family and only a few friends, an old man she visits, and her editor, known only as R. When she discovers that R is one of those individuals who can remember, she comes up with a plan to keep him safe. But will she succeed? And have you got a little bit to read? Because I think one of the things about this book is the style of the writing, isn't it? And this beautiful poetic quality that it has. The disappearance of the birds, as with so many other things, happened suddenly one morning. When I opened my eyes, I could sense something strange, almost rough, about the quality of the air, the sign of a disappearance. Still wrapped in my blanket, I looked carefully around the room. The cosmetics on my dressing table, the paper clips and notes scattered on my desk, the lace of the curtains, the record shelf, it could be anything. It took patience and concentration to figure out what was gone. I got up, put on a sweater, and went out into the garden. The neighbours were all outside too, peering around anxiously. The dog in the next yard was growling softly. Then I spotted a small brown creature flying high up in the sky. It was plump, with what appeared to be a tuft of white feathers at its breast. I had just begun to wonder whether it was one of the creatures I had seen with my father when I realised that everything I knew about them had disappeared from inside me. My memories of them, my feelings about them, the very meaning of the word bird, everything. What I like about that passage is it makes clear very quickly that things don't disappear in real life necessarily you know not without active intervention but they disappear from people's memories so for all intensive purposes they no longer exist it's almost like the sense that she still might see a bird in the sky 
but it would have no meaning for her. But then there was a kind of ambiguity to that because sometimes that seems sort of clear and straightforward, like, right, okay, the birds are still there, but they just don't mean anything to anyone. But then with the roses, when the roses disappeared, it was like the flowers just sort of collapsed, didn't they? And then there's this sort of beautiful image of these rose petals in the river. The river becomes pink with the rose petals. So sometimes things do vanish. Yeah, as if nature has intervened to blow all the rose petals. But then don't they have to go around and dig up all the rose bushes? Yeah, I guess. And then with the books, they definitely have to take a hand, don't they, in getting rid of the books. And then there's this very vivid scene of these books being burned. But that's what's so special about this novel, I think, is that it is ambiguous. And you don't quite know how to interpret it or you could interpret it in many different ways and I think the translation is probably brilliant I mean it is brilliant the language is beautiful but how the translator has managed to keep that ambiguity in the prose so that you're just left with questions I think is remarkable. Yeah I agree there is just this quality to the writing that almost felt quite Japanese to me it almost like it reminded me in some ways of other books and translation from Japanese that I've read. And so I thought there must be something about the rhythm and cadence of the Japanese language that's coming across here. And I really love that. I found it a bit flat sometimes. I think the Madeleine Tien comment about it being a deep pool is quite appropriate in a way. It does feel like a still limpid pool. There are no ripples on the surface. It's very smooth. It's very flat. And yet there's this tension, not quite dread, but it's, it's very unsettling. Perhaps that's the Mm. way to to think about Mm. it. There's a slide into oblivion, really. Yeah, and and there's a kind of blankness there that then echoes this idea of these lost memories and the people gradually become hollowed out. And the narrator realises this, doesn't she? She's Mm. sort of self-aware enough to understand, even if she can't intellectually comprehend the things that have gone because they are just gone to her, she still understands that there's a kind of thinness, a hollowing out. And I suppose Mm. you get a very clear sense of this because of her conversations with her editor, who's known only as R, who does still have his memories. And so he has all the rich complexity of human experience still available to him. We haven't explained, but because R can remember, our narrator is concerned for his safety. And so she, with the help of the old man, who is an old family friend, they set about creating this hidden room in between two levels of her house. And then she invites him to come and be safe and be hidden. He says yes, and leaves behind his pregnant wife, who's about to give birth, and then spends the remainder of the novel in this tiny hidden space. I didn't realise until I watched an interview with Fyoko Ogawa that she was very directly inspired by Anne Frank and her diaries and the idea of her being confined in this room. But I think what struck Ogawa when she read Anne Frank's diary was the richness of it and the fact that even though this little girl had been confined in this very small space, she was still able to grow. And for Ogawa, it was the writing she felt was what was giving Anne her freedom. And I thought that was a nice thread that runs through this book, this idea of writing things down and kind of creating things. It's important then that our narrator is a novelist. I'm not normally a fan of books within books. So one of the structural things that happens here is that you get to read the novel that our narrator is writing. And it's about a woman who attends a typing class and There's a very kind of charismatic teacher who she sort of falls in love with and she wants his attention and really is obsessing over him, thinking about him all the time. And gradually she's using her voice less and less and less and less. And then, well, I don't want to spoil it, actually, because it's one of the Mm -hmm. nice things is this story and the way that this story develops. That's very in keeping with the themes of the book. It's a beautiful, almost like alternate way of looking at the events that are happening within the novel itself. And it's also just a creepy ghost story that I actually really loved. I thought, you know, to write not one but two really great bits of fiction and package them all up was very (laughs) pleasing to me. I thought that really worked. I don't know what your book club thought. The book club thought it was brilliant. And Phil pointed out to us how they are mirror images of each other Mm. by the end, Mm. you know. I hadn't really processed the fact that they were mirror images and what happens in the main story, the opposite happens in her novel. But to your point about how she could write two quite gripping stories and package them together, the tone is so different. And Mm. before you were talking about how the main novel is like a pool of water. Yes, absolutely. But the tone and pace of the novel within the novel is completely different. Yeah, I hadn't picked up on that so much, but you're right. Yeah. I guess everyone just reads this novel quite differently because so many reviews pick up on things and I think, oh, really? You know, even the idea 
that this is somehow a reflection of society today with the rise of dictators? Can we call Trump a dictator? I mean, he likes to think he is. But I just felt that actually something more profound was going on here than just a examination of totalitarian governments, because the memory police aren't causing the disappearances, they're enforcing them. Mm. And there is a mystical element to these disappearances, not least with the fact that we are headed into an eternal winter at one point. Mm. Caitlin and I, the Canadian pragmatists, talked a little bit about how we struggled with the logistics of what was happening sometimes in terms of the economics of it and the size of this island. I worried about the economics. (laughs) Things are disappearing, but they're still managing and I overthought it. Yeah, no, no, no. uh, No, No, I think that's fair enough. That bothered me too. On a very fundamental level, she makes her living as a novelist, but it's been established really early on that people don't really read on the island. I'm like, well, how is she getting paid? Who's buying her books? (laughs) And and there's a publishing house, so yeah. who's paying their salaries? <laughs> and the food situation really worried me because sometimes things disappear and you're like, well, how how are they? What else are they eating? Like, where are they getting? Because there are no imports, there are no exports. And this is made very clear that, you know, one of the haunting elements of this is that the ferry disappears. The old man that she's friends with used to work on the ferry, didn't he? Isn't that he was connected with boats? Yeah, that's right. And yeah. then and then they forgot boats, and so now there's no way in, there's no way out. And you do have this chilling sense of well, what's going on? Are there people on the mainland who are just is everything normal there? You know, is it just something happening on this island? And I thought all that worked really well. That was quite good. I found that convincing. I didn't want to pick holes in that. But yeah, no, the food situation bothered me. I think Phil, who who chose this book for us, sort of thought we were missing the point. You know that this is a. <laughs> A philosophical exercise. (laughs) And, you know, it's not meant to be kind of unpicked in that way. But I almost think she wants us to struggle with it. It all feels very, very considered and deliberate. It was interesting. I also was slightly surprised by the Anne Frank connection when I sort of researched the book a little bit more, you know, because you just plunge in and read it, don't you, to start with. And yeah, despite the fact that actually there's this very clear thread of the idea of the secret room and they conceal the editor and, and then they have to make sure that he's got food and they have to figure it all out. Once you know, you're like, oh, yes, I see that now. But um, funnily enough, I found myself projecting on it the idea of dementia and the way that people's brains can play tricks on them, uh, the idea that, you know, with an ageing population, and I was thinking in Japan, that's more acute than it is here. This is a real problem with people not being able to remember things. And what does that mean when people can't remember things anymore? I found that quite sobering, thinking about that. For me, it became a meditation on what you can become accustomed to, what you can live with. And that made me think of the pandemic and the freedoms we have given up in order to save other people's lives, save our own lives, potentially. But, you know, we have given up a lot. We have given up human interaction in many different spaces. Right now, we're back to only being able to meet one person from one other household outside. And I'm not a libertarian, but I understand some of the criticism where they are saying we are giving up fundamental human freedoms, human rights. Who is the government to say that we can and cannot do these things that are fundamental to being human? Mm, Interesting question. Yeah, and I think that sense of the fact that people didn't fight against what was happening, you know, that it was this gradual incremental loss yeah. And that they almost were sort of sleepwalking into it. But because they were afraid, they see people being taken away and they, they're not indifferent. They're upset and distressed. But at the same time, it's kind of like, well, what can they do? Which brings us back to our narrator and her motivation for saving R comes from the fact that her own mother was taken away by the memory police. Jo used the term slippery. She said she loved the slipperiness of this novel. And on that, you know, beyond the language, the ethics of offering are the safe haven are also slippery. Joe was saying it actually made her quite uncomfortable that our narrator was like, oh, no, come on, come, come, R, you know, leave your wife, leave your baby, come into this cozy little hole I've created for you. Because her motives are not entirely pure, as becomes clear, I think, as the novel progresses. Yeah, there's definitely a real ambivalence there, which maybe makes it more interesting. You know, is it more interesting if you are not, 100% on the side of your main character probably is more human the author she knows what she's doing she didn't have to make it so that R's wife is pregnant and about to have a new baby you know that really heightens the stakes of his departure from that life what about the old man though the lovely old man so he's her friend and he's yeah (laughs) he's a good egg (laughs) he is and one of the things my book club felt is that the author is 
so good at these beautiful descriptions of mundane interactions. And there's a lot about our narrator and the old man sitting down to eat or have a cup of tea or just doing something nice together. There's these really small interactions that give meaning to their lives. Because if they didn't have each other, I don't know where they would be. Yeah, that relationship is the kind of saving grace of this novel. And is that what she's saying? That these are the things that we need to really cherish, these small interactions, these little things that bring us pleasure. I thought there was an interesting thing about the idea that when something is lost, not only the thing is lost, you know, like the roses, but all of the associations that go with the roses. So the sense, that evocation of summer, memories that it triggers in people, like it's not just the thing that it's lost, it's this whole web and network of associations that then diminishes people. And that's really beautifully held up here as something to consider. Mm. And yet, towards the end, the book lost a few of my book club members. I think it was Alice and definitely Caitlin, because something disappears that borders on the ludicrous. Mm -hmm. And so the tone shifts a little bit and you don't quite know what to do with it. It almost becomes slightly more fantastical, doesn't it? And less grounded in something that you really could see happening in reality. It becomes quite absurd. There are comparisons of this novel to Kafka's The Trial, which I read a long time ago and don't have a very good memory of. But I do recall being quite funny in its absurdity. And that begins to come out in this novel in a way that it hasn't earlier on. Mm. Can I throw in a couple of your favourite Amazon reviews that you hate? (laughs) Emma gave it three stars. She said, it's a very confusing read. While the concept is one that could have been fantastic, this story falls short for me. Hard to get into. Questions are left unanswered. There is no exploration as to why memories have been disappearing or the memory police structure. I'm not sure how to feel about this book. I'm a little empty. I'm not sure I would recommend it unless you're a fan of confusing classics. It's probably best placed in that genre. I love it. She's, she's <laughs> come up with a classic. special genre. Just. <laughs> like Kafka's The Trial. Absolutely, because once you put a label on it like that, you can immediately think of several books that will fall into the category of confusing <laughs> classics. Ms. Rachel Esther Epps said, dark and unsettling, a fantastic read. She gave it five stars. For me, this was a dark and unsettling book, but I loved it. So well written. The story keeps a good pace and I kept wondering how it would end. It even managed to encroach on my dreams one night. Highly recommended for this gripping read. And JP Fuller said, four stars. This was very enjoyable. A slow and unusual meditation on identity, memory and community. I guess it could be called dystopian, but it wasn't particularly unpleasant or doom laden, though the events were certainly unsettling. A really interesting, quirky and thought provoking book because the memory police, they're not instigating these events, are they? No. Uh, You know, they're enforcing them. But apart from that, they're not the people who are actually behind it. It's like Mm. they're just part of this whole yin yang thing that's going on. Well, come on then. So what did your book club think? I think they all thought it was a classic, you know, that it was quite remarkable, unique, all of those things. And we're very happy to have read it. Phil thought it was absolutely brilliant. But I just think Phil appreciates it on a different level. <laughs> to, not to all my book club. I'm sure lots of my book club members also got it. But definitely to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, what he's able to take away from this novel. I found it actually quite hard to read simply because... Right now, I'm looking for a bit of escapism in my reading. I loved the first 100 pages, but then as it gets increasingly bleak and the pace is slow, I kind of struggled a little bit. And like you, I don't love a novel within a novel. So sometimes I'd get to those passages and think, oh, God, I'm just not a very highbrow reader, clearly. (laughs) I think the problem with it is I didn't enjoy it that much as a read, if I'm honest. And certainly right now, I don't want to read books that leave me with a sense of creeping dread. That's the last thing I want to read. (laughs) You know, it really felt like the wrong book at the wrong time for me. And while I appreciated the way that it was written, I have to say I didn't particularly enjoy it while I was reading it. It reminded me a lot of Ishiguro, who actually I don't really like that much. So I haven't sought out his books, even though I think he's an amazing writer but what was the one uh, with the people you know the clones yeah um what's no, what's that i've book never called? read that Ooh. oh i can't remember see I, memory I, memory it's no. gone <laughs> i remember that there was a book and it was written by someone called ishiguro and it was about three people who were clones oh dear that's probably a massive plot spoiler for anyone who hasn't read it but what was that book called i'm trying to find out for you Never Let Me Go. Never Let Me Go. Yeah, you see, there you go, which which I thought was amazing, but I really just did not like the way that I felt. And, and The Unconsoled, another book of his that deals with kind of 
memory and, and a kind of interior life that I found almost unreadable. I, I, I hated it so much. Although, interestingly, I looked and The Guardian did it for their book club. And um, Sam Jordison, the person who runs that book club, is writing about how it's almost like deliberately something that's supposed to be almost intolerable to read. And I thought, oh, phew, that it wasn't just me. Anyway, mm-hmm. sidetracked. Oh. But- oh, no, no. All I was going to just say is that you've committed a faux pas that I made to my book club, which is thinking of Ishiguro as a Japanese author when he is British and he's writing in English. Of course, he might have a Japanese, you know, sensibility from his cultural background, but, you know, he's English. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? But I, there must be, it feels like too strong a parallel or too strong a resemblance between these styles of writing for it to be completely coincidental, which makes me think perhaps it is something in Japanese culture, in Japanese literature, in Japanese language, that's maybe something that people think about there, that's maybe not something that we dwell on in the same way here. I don't know. It just really struck me as I was reading this relationship between these two writers. And actually not one that I really enjoy, not an experience or style of writing I particularly (laughs) like. But Laura, but come on, as a book club book, oh my goodness, I think this is fantastic. I thought, my goodness, so many areas to explore. And I do think it's a classic. I think it's got that ambivalence, that blankness to it, that slight provocation. It kicks you into thinking about all of these things and considering society and where we are and what we're doing and the things we value and the things we don't. And in a really beautiful, understated way that I just thought was absolutely exquisite. And so while I might not have enjoyed curling up and reading it every night Mm -hmm. as a book club book and as a book to discuss and a book for people to think about and read, I just think it's one of the best ones we've ever done actually I loved it oh my yeah, wow. yeah. I'd go that far wow um <laughs> I think it did lead to a great discussion and everyone was you know delighted to have read it whether or not they loved it or not I didn't no one loathed it how could you how could you loathe it you'd be the ultimate philistine I had that funny sense you know as a past English literature graduate that this novel would really hold up to a lot of essays yeah absolutely that's right where you're like oh I could really write a thesis on I don't know, anything. And you can make the argument from multiple sides because the text is so rich and so dense and it's all there, but also it's quite contradictory. Yeah. So she's written over 30 novels, I think. Over 40. Over 40. Okay. And and how many have been translated into English? She's a phenomenon. She's like the Georgia Hare of Japan. Well, I think that's probably unkind (laughs) to to Ogawa, to be clear. And I've read Um, another one of hers, actually. I've read um, The Housekeeper and the Professor, which is another, I think it was the one that was published in English before this one. Okay. Very short. how was that? Very well written much lighter in tone than this it doesn't have any of the kind of you know existential dread that this does again though interestingly it picks up on the theme of memory the professor in question is a mathematics professor and he can only remember things for a day and the housekeeper is a woman who goes to work for him and and sort of look after him and manage his house and she has a son who turns out is also quite gifted with maths so these two form a connection but the point is that every day you know memento-esque the professor has to start again But it's much lighter in tone. To be honest, I read that. I didn't think that much of it in a way. I think the interesting thing about that is the way that she explores the mathematical concepts. And, you know, as anyone who's sort of delved into the world of mathematics a little bit, you know, sometimes I'm dragged into it through my children, you know, doing their maths homework. And the other day we were down a kind of rabbit hole about prime numbers and you start reading about Euclid and Greek number theory and then the way that you start getting into metaphysical stuff about primes and the patterns in the universe. And I mean, it's, if you follow certain paths into math, you get into some really fascinating theoretical stuff that starts to become poetry or philosophy. And she explored that, but not in a way that I thought was particularly novel or exciting. It was just there. And it was like, oh, right. Yes, she's thinking about that. I see. Yes, that is interesting. But it didn't leave me with anything that was going to stay with me or change me. It was just a kind of diverting short read that I quite enjoyed. This is such a different book, I think. And I was really pleased to have read this, having read that other one, and and gives me much more of a sense of her range and, and, you know, the possibilities of her writing. She also wrote a short novella called Pregnancy Diaries. And I'm really interested to read that. She left her job when she got married, as is often the way, I think even still now in Japanese culture. And she began to write. And if I'm getting this right, she didn't tell her husband she was writing. She had their first child. She would write a line every hour or so. And she said between like changing nappies and nap times, a line and then another line and then another line. And her husband didn't know that she was a published novelist, I think, until she won a literary award. Yeah, that's... And I just thought... 
That's how, interesting, isn't it? I mean, how what, bizarre. You know, that's not normal. You know, come on. <laughs> she didn't mention it to him. <laughs> I mean, that's quite an interesting insight into what she's like as a person. I think the fact that she would have actually concealed because you would have to, wouldn't you? Yeah. The fact that she was busy writing novels and actually getting them published. Yeah, I would read something else by her. And maybe I will start with the pregnancy diaries because I don't know, having been pregnant in recent history, I'd be interested in hearing what her experience of that was. I feel like she might bring some profound observations that have so far eluded me. (laughs) Yes, I think she's the woman to do it. Anyway, great book club book, highly recommended for discussion. If you are a reflective individual who likes to read meditative, slow, beautifully written books, you should also pick this up. But if you're after a page turner in our pandemic times, this is not the book for you. Inspired by the Memory Police, here are some more recommendations for your next book club book. The obvious thread to pick up on here is memory. And I was thinking, you know, while the Memory Police felt like a kind of cold look into a bit of an abyss, I was thinking about Piranesi by Susanna Mm. Clarke, which I read recently, which is sort of the opposite. It's kind of a warm hug of a book about memory. The main character is this individual you meet who lives in this strange environment, these stone halls where there's sort of nothing except for the sea and the birds and these endless, endless, endless rooms that have only statues in them. And the statues refer to things that we might recognise, like a beehive or uh, classical things or things from the real world. But you get the sense he's in this other place that isn't our world and you don't know why he's there he's collecting things he's observing things he's making notes he's sort of cataloging and it turns out he's doing this for a man who is also there i can't remember what he calls the other person can you remember he does have a name uh, what uh, i think we should just embrace all of our memory lapses in honor of the memory yeah police. you know normally i'd edit all this stuff out but maybe it needs to stay in there we're both slightly haplessly looking at our phones. I've reviewed this book like three times on Instagram. I think I did a little video thing about it and I still can't remember. I think it's because that character isn't really talked about in the reviews. I'm not even sure you mentioned him in your reviews. Is it the other? It is the other. Yeah, so our main character is Piranesi. It turns out that he isn't alone in this place. There's this other person who he knows as the other, who is interested in discovering the secret to this strange place that they're both in. And the other comes and goes, but Piranesi is there all the time. And gradually you start to understand who Piranesi is and why he's there. But the way that all that is revealed is really these kind of mechanisms of the plot reveals are just beautifully done it's like clockwork and it keeps ticking and gradually you start to piece it all together as your main character as Piranesi does and it's beautifully written it's atmospheric it just takes you to a place that you don't want to leave I love that idea you know just being haunted by these memories of this place that I've never been to it's not a real place it exists in Susanna Clarke's imagination but she made it real to me I think that's one of the really lovely things about this book and it does make you think about things in the way that Ogawa is obviously interested in the things in our world and how we value them and what they mean to us and what it might mean if they weren't there anymore, if they were gone. But Ogawa felt like things are falling into a void and there's just this absence. Whereas with Piranesi, the things are kind of held up and it's to do with memories of things that he doesn't even know what they are really, but they conjure up all these associations. And perhaps that's it. Perhaps the difference is that Piranesi almost like celebrates all these associations that we have with these things. And so it feels very warm and very rich. And plus, it's kind of a thriller, isn't it? It's a sort of good Mm. page turning plot. So yeah, (laughs) maybe as an antidote to the memory police, I recommend Piranesi. And I also just wanted to flag up only because I was thinking about it as I read the memory police. I was thinking about Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. Have you ever read that? I have read it. And I don't remember it at all. And I have this slight theory that dystopian novels, confusing classics even, because they don't always have an emotional depth to them. I think the memory police is different in that respect. But often because they're more plot driven or they're more intellectual exercises, I feel like you forget them. Uh Okay, well, let me remind you, Guy Montag is a fireman. His job is to burn books, which are forbidden, being the source of all discord and unhappiness. Arguably a point there, you know, I was reflecting recently. I wonder if I'd be a happier, less anxious person if I hadn't read so many really grim books 
<laughs> no, because you can and read the news. experienced all those. Yeah, but it's not the when you read it in a novel. I'm thinking of Shuggy mm. Bane. Shuggy Bane. I'm thinking of you. Anyway, so <laughs> let me let me continue. His job is to burn books which are forbidden, being the source of all discord and unhappiness. Even so, Montag is unhappy. There's a discord in his marriage. Are books hidden in his house? The mechanical hound of the fire department, armed with a lethal hypodermic escorted by helicopters, is ready to track down those dissidents who defy society to preserve and read books. Pick this up off the Waterstones site. One of the booksellers wrote, One of my favourite books of all time, what must have seemed like pure science fiction when it was written, is not so far from the truth today. Instead of firemen burning books, we're downloading them into oblivion. And I just thought, yeah, it's picking up on that thing that the Wired article was picking up on as well, which oh, is the idea you know, of the digital... I, just... oh, I think people are over-egging this digital forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> I confess I haven't read it for a long time, although I have read it a couple of times. The main thing I remember about it is it's a cracking page turner. It's not a long read. It's one of those books that really grabs you. It's incredibly vivid. It's almost quite fun the way that it explores all these ideas and makes you think about books. There's a lot of book burning, isn't there? And I just think for a book club read and one for people to discuss and think about, it sort of feels like it should be like in the essential canon of book club reads, shouldn't it? Yeah. We should put one together someday, shouldn't we? Like the books. That... The classics. Yeah, the, the classics. classics you should read as a book club. Yeah. The short classics. <laughs> we wouldn't hoist a long 500 page classic on our listeners. Although I would have to make a case for War and Peace. But yeah, very relevant <laughs> themes. Picking up on the memory piece, it warms a future populated by non-readers and non-thinkers, a lost people with no sense of their history. Well, on that front, picking up in that vein, I am going to recommend We by Yevgeny Zemyatin, oh. the dystopian classic that no one knows about. Of course. Um, but which was the inspiration for George Orwell's 1984. It got there first, and yet 1984 is held up as being this groundbreaking forerunner of dystopian literature. Anyways, um, we did a special episode on We. Yevgeny Zemyatin wrote it. Ooh, good question. When did he write it? Ooh see if I remember. I'm going to go for 1950s? No! Earlier? 1920. 1920 to 21. But it wasn't published in Russian until 1988 because it was seen as so seditious yeah. by Stalin. It's coming back to me now. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was published in English back in the 1920s, but not in Russian Set in the 26th century AD, Zamyatin's masterpiece describes life in the regimented totalitarian society of one state, ruled over by the all-powerful benefactor. We is the archetype of the modern dystopia, or anti-utopia. It is about D-503, and he is an engineer, as was Zamyatin, and he has just made the Integral, which is a spaceship that is going to introduce non-freedom to other alien societies in outer space. But D-503 has just fallen in love, really, in a society where love is not allowed, with I-330, who is this charismatic, sharp, angular woman with an X across her face. Or is it across her face? The prose is very unusual in this book. And we talked a lot about that in episode 13, where we had our dedicated discussion of this book, which I should say was linked to the Happy Reader special edition that focused on we. Um, why would it be a great book club book? It's the original dystopian novel and therefore it picks up on all these themes of, you know, what is happiness and what is love and is there freedom in conformity or is freedom only truly found by removing yourself from constraints? We had a great time discussing it. So we know it's a good book club book. And it's a fun, I remember it as a fun read. It's quite silly in mm. many ways, but in a profound way, I'm not even sure. Hence why it would be a good book club book. Mm. Yeah, that's a great one. I love We. I look back on that very fondly. There is a dystopian book club out there, isn't there? We haven't interviewed them, but I'm sure they're out there. Yeah. <laughs> they're probably holed up in a um, prepper's cabin somewhere. Books for the end of the world. But we don't want to read books for the end of the world when the world is ending, as we have learned. <laughs> the world isn't ending. <laughs> no, I know. Not I'm today. <laughs> ah, speaking of disappearances, total segue... But in a very dramatic way earlier today, you were describing my impending move to the other side of the world, listeners, <gasps> as a disappearance oh my goodness, in line Laura with is the about memory to police. become one of the things that's absent from my life. I am moving to Vancouver, where I grew up very imminently, assuming I can get on a plane. I will be in Vancouver before the end of November. But it's not the end of the podcast. No, definitely not. Or our friendship. Because thanks to the global pandemic, 
we've discovered that we can record via Zoom as easily as we can record in person. It's going to be exciting, isn't it? We're going to become a transatlantic podcast. And we'll probably be reading a more diverse selection of novels because what comes out in Canada is not always the same as what comes out here. We'll be able to get your dad on as a guest. (laughs) (laughs) I will see if he listens to this episode and if the seed is planted. I feel like he'd be quite daunted, but you know, you never know. Yeah, no, that'd be great. That's all for this episode. Our book recommendations were Piranesi by Susanna Clark, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury, and We by Yevgeny Zamyatin. If you enjoy the show, check out our brand new website, where you can find our archive of over 70 shows to browse through, including our last episode on Bonjour Tristesse by Francois Sagan. And in our library section, you'll also find book reviews and articles, including one devoted to the very best Georgette Heyer novels and why her Regency romances are the perfect antidote to our troubled times. You'll find it all at thebookclubreview.co.uk. You can also get in touch with us there or follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or email thebookclubreview at gmail.com. Tell us what you're reading for Book Club right now. We love to hear from you. And if you're not already, why not subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts? If you like what we do, please take a moment to rate, review and subscribe. It helps other listeners find us and means you'll never miss an episode. But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>